All right, thanks. Um, so I guess I actually looked at the questions that were sent out. I didn't actually answer them on the Google poll, but I did think about them when I put this talk together. So the, the first question was, what is the, define the bioeconomy? So this is, uh, Tom Richards knows this. He was a part of it. I think a couple other people in this room were. But there was a UN scope study done, I guess, two years ago about, uh, well, specifically what it says right there in the title, bioenergy sustainability between the gaps. So what would the ideal state look like? I think a lot of speakers have really touched on aspects of this or not holistically this morning. Um, you know, one thing that this, I think, unique that this slide shows is that the potential is significant. If, if you look at um, um, the potential of bioenergy in sustainable context of food, feed, fiber, land use, all that, it, it comes out to be about 10 to 30 percent. And, and granted, that's based on current efficiencies and it, it is based on population growth. I think it was based on 9 billion, not the 10 billion we heard this morning. But um, re really, that's kind of, I won't um, vote, you know, spend a lot of time on this, but really in that context is how I put this together. So the next question is, you know, where do we stand now? And, and as I think we all know, it's a bit of a mixed bag. There, there's some successes and there's some not so good scenarios. Um, you know, most of the developed world is in a market-driven economy. And, and, and I guess the best comment about the market-driven economy worldwide is kind of Churchill's comment about democracy, right? The worst form of government except for all the others. So, so I think the market-driven economy is kind of the same thing, right? It, it, there's a lot of downsides. It, it's not necessarily good holistically or um, for, for uh, planet sustainability does not really come into it. But so far, nobody has come up with a better scenario. So, so the, the reality is we probably will live in a market-driven economy for the, CV, <coughs> excuse me, for the foreseeable future. That means bioenergy has to compete on a cost basis with um, petroleum or, or natural gas or, or even coal. So, um, you know, but we're really not talking about coal here. We're talking about transportation fuels, so it's, it's petroleum. So as we all know, we're in a low price scenario. Um, Harry Baum's slide showed a much more optimistic um, slide for increasing petroleum prices than I've seen. What, what I've seen is it's really predicted to stay low for um, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, <clears throat> mostly due to what we heard this morning, horizontal fracking and, and drilling. So anyway, so as it stands right now, we're really not cost competitive with petroleum for first, uh, excuse me, for second generation biofuels. You can argue whether they were there for first generation biofuels. But, but you know, I don't, I don't want to stand up here and say everything's doom and gloom because it's not. There, there's a lot of positive scenarios. COP21, increased enlightenment to global warming and what the impacts for transportation fuels are, California's low carbon fuel standards, um, CAFE standards, fuel efficiency standards. I'll, I'll cover later what I more by, mean by that. And then finally, market successes for some bioproducts. So let, let's look at, you know, I kind of drilled down. So one of the big issues, as we all know, for biofuels is the whole food versus fuel. So that always comes back to how much land is and what's the ethical use of that land. And I think we all agree that food production has to be number one. So does that necessarily take biofuels out of the equation? Um, absolutely, positively, no. So if you look at you know, big, big squares, this, this shows you that arable land is a, it's significant. I mean, that's a significant portion of global land because obviously we're looking at tundra, desert, and everything. So that is significant. But then, um, you know, you look at what's currently used, even do it first generation technologies, it, it's small. So, so basically there, there's, there is enough land available for biofuels production um, synergistic with food and fiber and materials, but it, but it has to be done sustainably. So, you know, I think we've all seen this. Um, really, and, and some people will make this an ethical, moral argument. I, I'm not going to go that far. But, but, but what I will say, and, and I agree with a lot of these studies that have been done, pasture land is really the best use, um, excuse me, is the best opportunity in the context of sustainability, food, fuel, for biofuels expansion. So what does that mean? Um, well, that means that if, in fact, we're going to be using pasture land, the, the whole commodity-driven economy that we live in with market-driven economies like U.S. or a lot of countries, of, of bigger and better, 
probably isn't going to work for biofuels. So if we purely price energy on a commodity basis per big gigajoule or, or a liter of fuel or whatever, um, it's going to be hard to compete against petroleum. But, but if we say, okay, it's not, it's not energy consumption, it, it's human development index. This is a Kaya curve. This is just plotted differently than what we saw this morning. You know, this, where he showed UK versus US, I'm kind of showing US versus Germany. So you see almost a double US per capita energy consumption that you do in Germany with, with essentially the same, in, same human development index. So basically what that proves is just using more energy. And you know, you can put UK on there, you can put a lot of countries on there. Just using more energy does not necessarily mean better quality life. So, so we have to use that energy more intelligently and, um, and, and really um, more efficiently as far as HDI. And then in that context, bioenergy on pasture land makes sense. So what, what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is, is I'm a technologist. I'm, a, I'm an engineer, actually, a chemical engineer. So I'm not going to really look at it from the economic perspective. I'm going to look at what the technology needs to be to achieve those economics. So here is kind of the first generation cellulosic ethanol plants. Um, so I compared these with oil. I didn't actually do this legally, and if Dartmouth did this. So what he compared was oil at $100 a barrel, $30 a barrel. Actually, it's up from that now. I think as this morning, it's like 45, 46. But, but essentially what it shows is that cellulosic ethanol with the current technologies, it's just not cost competitive with oil. So unless there's a carbon tax or whether there's some sort of macro policy incentive to, to drive that, it's probably not going to happen. And you know, a lot of people mention the contentious nature of the US election, Brexit, you know, the impeachment of the president in Brazil. There's a lot of issues that really show sustainable incentives to, to put biofuels at a cost parity based on incentives are not sustainable over the long term. So, so really, they have to compete with, in, until a, the world agrees on a global carbon tax, have to compete on a um, cost basis. So, so basically, this just shows that it's not going to happen at $30 a barrel or $50 a barrel with current technologies. So, so what needs to happen? Again, this was put together by Leland. Um, and, and what this shows is, is the upper line is kind of in, of a macro average of current cell pioneer cellulosic ethanol plants. And, and as you can see by the huge, like I showed on the previous slide, the huge um, economies of scale on these plants, you really have to go quite large to get the cost down to um, petroleum, e even at $70, $80 a barrel. So um, the problem with that is it's a lot of risk, um, capital risk, plus it requires huge areas of land or huge productivity on, on land, which pushes it on arable land, which isn't sustainable. So, so basically, we have to get the um, technology down to it's simpler. Right now, like a corn plant, we'll take, or a corn, uh, let's take a sugar plant, for instance, a, a sugar cane ethanol plant in Brazil. It's basically two steps. You crush the corn, I mean, crush the sugar cane, get the sugar, ferment the, um, to ethanol, it's, and then distill the ethanol. Th three steps. If, if you look at a corn plant, it, it's four steps. You look at a cellulosic ethanol plant, depending on how you count the steps, it can be as high as 9 or 10. So, so in, in, in essence, that just proves it's too capital intensive and too many steps. So, so there are some advanced technologies. I won't go into them here. But, but really, advanced technologies to get those economy scales down to the sugar cane. Uh, petroleum refining is a lot of steps. But you're using a thermo um, chemical, uh, using a thermo process, which extremely high throughput. So comparing uh, petroleum processes to biorefinery processes is really an apples and oranges. Anyway, th there's a lot of research needs to get those plant sizes down, get the capital intensity up, so that way we can compete. I mean, the, that way they can be a viable on the uh, pasture land. Um, the other thing I want to touch about, and th this is kind of interesting. This is not kind of interesting. This is very interesting. So, so right now I think we all assume the fundamental assumption that we all go in is we have to produce fuels that burn in today's cars, today's engines. Spark ignition, uh, you know, gasoline, petrol, um, compression emission, dist distillate or diesel. And, and, and that absolutely, and, and then the efficiency of cars is, you know, it's a mature technology. We've had internal combustion engines for 100 years. 
Therefore, efficiencies are only you know, incremental gains at best. And in essence, and then you know, we all know the Volkswagen scandal, that um, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but in essence it's true. Spark ignition is inefficient, but clean burning. Compression ignition is very efficient, but dirty burning. So you know, you're always caught between those two, and, and Volkswagen kind of proved that, right? I mean, they had very efficient engines, but they kind of cheated on the emissions to get the um, emission standards. You know, so, so can you have both? Can you have high efficient engines that are clean burning? And, and, and the answer is yes. Um, and, and biofuels can enable those. Um, so, so here's world efficiency standards. Um, th this is more of a global thing versus a U.S. thing. In the U.S., you know, we always like to see lines going up. So, so this, um, this means the lines go down, which is actually a good thing in this chart. This is consumption. So CO2 per kilometer or liters per 100 kilometers. So basically right where we stand now, the world's all over the place in fuel efficiency standards. But as we go forward, um, assuming that none of these get overturned, um, we're all going to about a four liter per 100 kilometer standard, which is about 2x where we stand right now. So that, that means engines have to get more efficient. So what, I, I won't go into this. Well, yeah, I will. So, so gasoline is basically um, only about 38. Diesel's about 45. And these advanced compression engines are about 50. So, and, and to put that in context, fuel cells are about 60. Um, electric vehicles, if, if, you, if you just count the battery, I mean, excuse me, if you just count the electricity and the battery to turn in the wheels, they're amazing. They're like 85% efficient. But if, but if you take the fuel from the power plant to the uh, cars turn, you know, the wheels turn in, the car going down the road, it's about 70%. So, the, the, you know, can you get internal combustion efficient as electric? No, you can't. But, but can you get it better on an efficiency basis than it is now? And, and the answer is yes. And, and this slide is kind of cool. We haven't seen one of these today. Um, this, this is actually fuel being injected in your engine. So, you know, picture your, com your piston engine and a diesel and a gasoline both have um, um, pistons. So basically what I'm trying to show you here is the reason that gasoline is, is clean burning is it's completely mixed when it's burned, but hence that's inefficient because it, it burns slowly and then when the piston's all the way down, you get low efficiency. Diesel, it ignites instantaneously when your piston's at the top, therefore you get the full force of the um, fuel burning to drive your piston down, hence high efficiency. But that's, that's because it's not mixed, you get soot, hence, you know, AKA Volkswagen, or any truck that drives down the road, you have to put particulate filters on there, you have to do oxygen injection, you have to do all this stuff. So can you put oxygen in the fuel and, and kind of um, solve, get the best of both worlds? And, and the answer is yes, very much. You can get the efficiency of compression ignition but the clean burning of gasoline. So if you enable that by biofuels, you actually provide a market pull, you actually provide a better scenario, higher efficiency. So it's kind of Tom's point where he showed the materials. So you're actually, not only are you just displacing fossil fuels, I, I didn't calculate a whole certain of multipliers, you know, we'll just take Tom's word for that. But, but essentially, you can, it's more than a gallon per gallon replacement the carbon benefits you're getting. You can get as high as 1.5, 1.6 carbon in, um, benefits. You know, I'm not going to go into whether the future of transportation is electrics and light duty or, or but right now, you know, um, car sales worldwide are almost 97% internal combustion engine, actually 98%. So internal combustion is here to stay for the foreseeable future. So we can make it more efficient. And then with diesel as goods and all that kind of stuff. So I, I don't think internal combustion for transportation is going away anytime in the next 50, 100 years. But the, the final thing I wanted to say is, is the other thing that we kind of put um, biofuels at um, a disadvantage is we're like, we got to make fuels. Um, you know, you take only 15% of the barrel of petroleum goes into products, and, and products are everywhere. They're right in the building, they're in our clothes, they're in our seats, they're everywhere. We heard from Tom that, that the carbon efficiency of building materials is not the, not the bad guy, right? It's the carbon efficiency emissions from the fuels that's the bad guy. However, we can't make the fuels competitive market from a market-driven perspective unless we have the high value of the, of the products. And that's what this shows. Only 15% of the barrel goes into making the products, but 50% of the economic output is, is, the, um, is the products. 
So if we say, okay, biofuels, we're only going to make fuels, we're not going to make products, we're, we're already you know, running a race with, with one leg and a cast, right? We're, we're, we're not going to win. Um, we're, we're not going to compete. So, you know, er everybody knows that. That's not new. But so it's like, okay, let's make chemicals from biomass. And, and we've tried that and we've had some women's success. But, but these are some interesting charts here. And um, I'm probably the first one to have some organic chemistry on the slide. So do I get a prize for that? But um, anyway, organic chemistry aside, what, what this shows is the whole suite of, of chemicals in terms of market volume versus price. And as you can expect, the lower volume ones are higher price. Gasoline and diesel are way up at the top, high volume, low price. Um, so if we're going to make gasoline and diesel, we probably don't want to make that from biomass. We, we just really don't want to do that. We want to make this stuff that's higher value and, and takes advantage of the oxygen. You know, as we know, hydrocarbons are hydrogen and carbon. Biomass is 40% oxygen. So probably about a third of the chemicals we use have oxygen in them. So, so it, it's not as simple to say that chemicals that have oxygen are advantaged from biomass. It, it's not as simple as that. It depends on the backbone. It depends. That's what this carbon, what all this organic chemistry in this slide is about. But, but what it does say is some products are better made from biomass. And, and not only can you actually have direct replacements, you can actually have products using the advantage properties of that biomass they're actually advantageous, actually better than the materials we make now. You can have, like, for instance, I, I would love to, uh, everybody should, I don't have it. Well, yeah, I do have it. Um, you know, iPhone, as, as we all know, we probably all carry iPhones. And if we drop it now, it won't shatter, right? But, but you know, 10 years ago, <laughs> you try it if you want. Uh, <laughs> but if you have a, an iPhone 4 and before, don't do that, it will shatter. Um, and, and really, I'd love to tell you the, the chemical that came in there that, um, keeps iPhone screens from shattering, came from biomass, it didn't, but it is an oxygenate. The, the, the actual uh, chemical in there that keeps them from shattering is an oxygenate. So, so that's actually, uh, it didn't come from biomass, but it, it just shows you if we think about it um, intelligent and creatively and say, okay, let's make products better, um, you can actually sh have a higher economic value. You can actually increase, it's kind of like my fuels example. You can actually make it better through biomass. So, th so that's my point. Um, you know, I, I, the first point I think is we all, the first two points we all know. Nothing that I'm saying that hasn't been said so far today. Positive trends, but we're clearly, um, energy efficiency is going better, but carbon emissions with population energy increase is only going to get worse. You know, we'll overshoot to two to three, even four degree. I think right now we're on a five degree Celsius curve. However, we, we do need bio, biomass, number of people, you know, we've all know this. Biomass is really needs to be a part of a sustainable energy future. But I think the, the point, the unique point that I'd like to make is, is we sh shouldn't just look at it replacing fossil fuels. We shouldn't say, oh my gosh, I replaced a gallon of gasoline with a gallon of ethanol, therefore I'm a success. It, 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 that's very simplistic. We, we can do better than that. We can enable higher efficiency, lower emitting engines. We can enable better products. We just have to be very sophisticated and we actually have to leapfrog the fossil fuels industry, so that's my point. Thank you.